welcome to my walkthrough of designing a twin motor rear axle assembly for a Hacky Racer. This is probably now about the fourth iteration of the design I've been doing on the, the rear axle assembly for a Hacky Racer. The first one was pretty much a sort of standard single axle solid all the way through with a single brushless motor on a sprocket. That worked pretty well but you know you need to move forwards. The next one was um, using a differential so again single motor but a differential so you've got a split rear axle and um, that was great um, but you do suffer problems because it's an open differential of one wheel spinning if it loses traction. The third was a bit of a hybrid between a split rear axle with two motors which are initially designed to use the foot mounting point on the motors um, which then got changed over to the, the face and finally this one which I think is sort of the end at the moment of the, the derivations where you've got split rear axle, twin motors, simplified mounting for the motors um, and I think it makes a nice compact assembly and something that hopefully others will see and maybe get some inspiration for your own designs. So without further ado, let's move over to the design. So a lot of those design decisions are driven by the motors that I'm using. Now this motor is not quite the same as the ones I'm going to use. It's a little bit longer, but in terms of um, demonstration purposes, it will do fine. It's got the same sprocket, same diameter, foot and cabling. So firstly what I wanted to do was have two motors, one there, one there. So that sets a sort of distance apart that you can have the motors because you want them to run that way so the sprockets themselves or the pinions in this case have to be a certain distance apart because it's governed by essentially the length of the motor plus a little bit for the, the cabling. The other key design decision I had, especially with Hackies, was the overall width. Now the overall width of a Hacky from outside face of the tyre to outside face of the other tyre is set around 750mm. I quite like that width, it works quite well in terms of the, the overall Hacky size. Although Hackies can go up to 900mm, if you go that wide, you get problems with um, you, you know just overtaking people. The course at times can narrow to around sort of two meters um, on broaden out. So if you've got a hacky that's almost a meter wide, 900 millimeters, somebody else has got a hacky that wide, then you know you're going to give yourself problems in terms of trying to get by them on narrow sections. So I wanted it to be a little bit tighter in. What that actually means is if the outside tyre faces are 750 millimetres uh, face to face is the actual uh, flanges that the wheels bolt onto are then about 650 millimetres um, apart. So that in itself governs some of the overall characteristics. The, the other thing and one of the key learnings from um, building Let's Go is originally built Let's Go and I was using the foot on the bottom of the motor. Now, these feet um, uh, look great. They're sort of designed for four bolts, bolt it onto um, your, your frame and off you go. The problem with them is that they are very soft aluminium. So with the motor, with a torque reaction from the motor. So as it spins, the motor twists. Um, that twisting eventually uh, makes the, um, the foot here uh, no longer straight. So in this one, although you can't probably pick it up on the camera, not only is it bent uh, in itself, so it sort of does an S shape, it's offset from the overall motor. So it's no longer, um, like that with the motor it sort of does that because of that torque reaction. So what I did 
part way through the build of Let's Go was convert from using the foot uh, on the motor to using the face mounts. And so the face mounts here are, um, there's two 6mm bolts there, two 6mm there, and you can bolt it with there. But I didn't want to disturb the frame uh, design too much, or I spent probably too much time building the thing. So really what I wanted to do was just bolt on the motors and off we, off we went. So I did a sort of conversion bracket from these four holes and the feet to use invert the face. And it, it works, but it's it's uses the, the design for four bolts on the frame, but face mount on here uh, in a sort of carrier. And what that meant was, when I first tried it, was was you, you ended up with something that had lateral motion that way, twist motion that way, and rotation that way. So one of the things that I really wanted to do was simplify the design, and that's what I want to show you is how I've simplified the design and what that design looks like. So this, believe it or not, is the simplified design. And I'm going to walk through each of the pieces on this and the decisions I took for that. So firstly, let's just look at, this is the top, that's facing forwards, and the, the piece farthest away is the back of it. And you can see is it's relatively compact, I say the, this dimension here is about 650 millimeters, and it's designed for the motors to sit here. And it's also designed so that there can be a shock absorber there, and one there, although it's debatable why it needs. I welded the brackets on, whether I just put a piece of steel there or something, I don't know. These are pivot points, so these would be welded onto the frame so that you got articulation this way. But before we get into how the, the motors mount, I'm gonna turn it over so you can see what's effectively the bottom of it, and we'll talk about that. So, on the bottom of this, and it's going to want to go the, the wrong way, so let's prop it up with the, with the motor, is you can see more clearly that the arrangement of, as you come in, there's the mounting flanges for the wheels, there's the brake discs, sprockets, and empty space. And let's go, the sprocket was the outer and the disc was the inner. And you think, well, what's the big deal with that? What it actually means is that you can't get the pinion as close as you'd like to um, to the, the base of the, the chassis. Because if you imagine with this way round, the motor can sit like that. If you're if the brake disc was a pocket, you're up here. So you're immediately raising the height of a motor in comparison to the rest of the design. So I didn't want that, so I brought those in. But that also meant that I had to sort of push the sprockets out side to side. Um, the other thing that is not so noticeable is the brake calipers um, from our friends at AliExpress and um, all hydraulic sit on the base. So they don't sit on top because they're only 140 millimeter brake discs. They sit on top. So they would go, turn it around, so it's right around. They go sort of there and there's a corresponding one over here and they provide the, the braking. Ideal world, I would have them not on the bottom, as you can see here, this is a bit closest to the ground, is I'd have them underneath, as you're looking at it at the moment. Um, the problem with that is the hubs that I was using um, meant that um, 
I can only use a maximum size of 140 millimeter brake disc without really faffing about and and sort of making uh, hubs or something like that. I really didn't want to get into that, so I decided that I wanted to avoid that, and I took the compromise of having the calipers on the underneath of the vehicle rather than on top of the vehicle. So, just one thing to, to bear in mind. The other thing that I was really conscious of was I didn't want any so actual movement that way of the, the shafts. Um, my first hacking, I had that problem. And what it effectively means is you want the pinion to be exactly in line with the sprocket. If you don't have that, what happens is it's a bit like a racing bike where you change gears, is if you've got an offset of a pinion either side, it is the chain tries to jump the teeth onto what would be the next socket. Of course, the next socket doesn't exist, and therefore the, you just shed a chain. Um, really frustrating when that happens because effectively it means that you're you no longer got much power. And even though it's two motors, you lose one motor, you effectively got half power, so you're pretty pretty much out for the count there. So one of the things I did with the welding of the hubs here was make sure that the pillow bearings that you can see here are basically against those hubs. So there's absolutely no way for it can move either side. It also meant by doing that, by the welded components on the axle, the hubs, onto the pillow bearings, there was no need for any packing washers, collar sleeves, anything like that. So your component count goes down, and therefore, you know, in many ways, the cost goes down as well. So that, that was a natural benefit. I did hit one problem, is I bought an axle off AliExpress, and it's not, although I said it was 20 millimeters in diameter, it's not quite. A section was 20 millimeters. This is seven eighths of an inch. So I've ended up with a 20 millimeter pillow bearing there and a seven eighths inch pillow bearing there, along with some washers just to make sure that they were in line and all working. The other bit I want to show is what I'm doing with this gap. So let me just get that. So and let's go. The speed controllers are mounted underneath the seat, which works, um, but it does lengthen the, the wiring, and especially when you're trying to get a self-contained rear axle, it does mean that it's a lot harder than to to do it if you have them underneath the seat. So I wanted the speed controllers to be integral to this axle. So here's the speed controller. This is where I put the brackets. And the speed controllers fit here. And another one will fit there. And what I've got is weld nuts. So it makes it really easy to bolt these on, bolt these off um, as needs be without... Um, so anything uh, additional, spanners on the top and the bottom and, and nothing about like that. Because of the fuse that we use, which is 30 amps, if I use two of those 1500 watt controllers, I blow the fuse. So what I'm actually using is a smaller speed controller, 1000 watt, which sits there. So what I've got is a piece of aluminium, it's bolts to them, but aluminium bolts to the same location points that the 1500 watt does. So if I ever had the chance, I can easily swap the controllers. I don't need to change the frame, add in extra bits of metal as required. The other key thing that I try to do as well is make everything work for its money. This is quite heavy even on its own. So what I did is this is a support for the motor. It's a support for the speed controller. And it also gives um, strength to the frame as well. These are supports for the um, bumper. 
which are welded on, but they also strengthen the corners. And I've got some corner fillets at the, the back here, so that it just makes it um, stronger in twist. Um, yeah, because you are bouncing over things, and you know my welding's never going to win any um, any awards for it. So let's let's just take these brackets off, and let's have a look. So they're tie wrapped on, just so I don't lose them. Um, always a good thing while you, I've got a number of projects on the go. Don't want to lose bits, and I'll show you what those brackets are in a second. So let's just flick this back over, and hopefully we can we can talk about the the motor. So when you look at the look at the axle assembly, is the key concern of the axle assembly is um, firstly is the pinion to sprocket alignment. Now essentially, once you've set that, it stays set because we've talked about the axles don't move that way. If you stop the motor moving that way, then they stay in alignment. What does happen though, is that the chain itself, which is a T8F chain, um, stretches. Uh, I swear they make them out of cheese or something, but they stretch. So you have to then uh, allow for easy setting of the, the chain tension. And I've gone, tried a number of different ways to do this and this is one I've come up with and because of a change in the um, the way that I've gone about the the um, the, the motor uh, mounting itself has made it a lot easier when I was using the foot you had to do packing and you know you you were it's like a 3d puzzle that you're trying to do doing it this way with the face mounting means it's essentially 1d puzzle and so this goes on the face of the motor so if you pick up the motor so this will take the sprocket off it'll go over the shaft bolt on there there's a similar one for the back so that the back gets support like that and all that really means is you've then got a, what's essentially an A-frame. So if you imagine this was sitting here, and I'm probably obscuring it, but if, if that was there, is it means that by sliding that up and down like that, you're changing the distance of that shaft relative to the sprocket and hence nice and easy to tension that chain whereas before packing pieces and stuff like that so what what it is is you know a couple of spanners a couple of 10 mil spanners slacken off bolts which are here so you have this piece here which is holding the motor this piece here which is also holding the motor and they can move that way and this completes the A-frame so that you get that adjustment that you want on the, on the sprocket and pinion um, distance. One thing that I've done as well is I've set these in probably three or four millimeters away from actual perfect alignment here. So what that means is rather than the pinion normally being bang on there it's actually when I first will put motors in it will be inset probably three or four mil and you think well why did I do that well it just gives me the opportunity to put in two or three little washers just to get that bang on and then by doing that is that set it never changes, it won't change because as we said before, nothing's moving actually that way. So that's set, uh, that's perfect. Um just need you always need a little bit of play um just to take into account, you know, as things wear and just generally get beaten up. But that gives me that. And there we are. That's the, the rear axle assembly. That took 
far more time to build than I actually thought it would. But 